this is me. As a drinks man, I've been lucky enough to travel the world pouring drinks and mixing cocktails for all sorts of people, and it's provided me with a really good living. But until recently, I hadn't had much time to explore my love of food, other than swapping cocktails and wine for kitchen secrets from some of the world's best chefs. So I made a few phone calls, packed my bags and camera, and set off on my own culinary adventure to discover my farming childhood roots, the food I grew up with. I like to call it green food. And this is the story of a generation of people who embrace it. So the story is, is uh, uh, I finished up in Sydney last night about one o'clock in the morning and uh, we're at the airport at some ungodly hour about five. Uh, we've landed in Mildura and as we came in we flew over all these uh, these wineries and it's like a factory out here it's uh, it's not done for the gentle sort of family kind of winery you get in other parts of the world this is on a massive scale this is where the majority of our grapes are grown for wine as a result there's some lakes that we went over that were just completely desolate like all the all the water reserves were gone and it looked like the salt table was rising so uh, in Mildura we're going to go meet uh, Stefano De Peri, Stefano, and uh, well, he's got a whole lot of things to say, I'm sure. But uh, as far as I understand, we're going to bake some bread and drink some beer. I'd visited Mildura before. It's a hub to much of Victoria's primary resources, providing fruit, wine, and other vital produce for local and export trade. But I'd never before visited a salt farm. This is as a result of a rising salt level in the, in the ground, right? This is a well, this is the result of trying to prevent that salty aquifer yeah. from surging up and damaging the land. Right. So there's a pump down there that sucks that water up and drags it into these ponds. Some of it goes to waste as well. Yeah. Some of it may go flow back in and come up again. But the idea is to remove that pressure so that that bubble doesn't expand and kind of break into the bed of the Murray River, for example, yeah. because if it did and all this salt went in, you could kiss goodbye to the entire Murray Darling irrigation system. To think that we used to import majority of our salt from Britain and now we're selling this as now, gourmet salt. Back now to I the can Brits. brag because I met here <laughs> with Duncan and uh, years ago and I said, do you realize that they import flake salt from England? And I said, if you can flake this, which has the added advantage of being pinkish, although it can't be seen with this daylight, you will have a unique Australian product. And luckily for gastronomy, he listened to me, took a massive punt and began very, very slowly on this very drying uh, pan with a small quantity of salt and now I can see that he's gone one, two, three, four and he's building a big processing plant right behind there. Yeah. It means that Australians and the world have taken advantage of a wonderful flavor that comes as a result of an environmental intervention. How sweet is it though? Well, it's certainly not that sharp uh, sharpness that you get with our, our salt. Yeah. So after a generous mouthful of salt, it was back to Stefano's where he oversees the production of brewing beer using local ingredients like wheat, barley and honey. His cafe provides locals with top quality cakes and pastries alongside his extensive range of infused oils, jams and chutneys. But most of all, his customers love him for his delicious, baked daily, loaves of country style bread. Uh, let me tell you this, we are surrounded by square miles and square miles, hundreds of thousands of them, of wheat. There's a belt around Mildura. It starts at Bendigo and finishes somewhere halfway to Broken Hill. Wheat everywhere. And what do people eat? I'm afraid to say, the thin frisbees. And unfortunately, we have lost the art. And there are fewer and fewer bakers who know how to do it from scratch. There are fewer and fewer people who are using natural ingredients to make bread without things that will make it soft, that will stop it from developing mold, that will give it color. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into bread which is really not needed. 
That's why I've got Paul here, he's a master Paulie. baker. Right. Paulie. Paulie is the love of my life, I must <laughs> tell you. Because yeah. he's more important to what I do than anybody else. Because I wanted to say to local people and to our customers, let's eat real bread. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be at the extreme of the super sourdoughs, for instance, quite heavy and bulky. They're delicious as well. But for everyday purposes, let's have some natural bread. Look at that. Smell it. It is not a full 100% sourdough, but it's got a lovely develop. So let me let me see if I'd like to cut through here. Yeah, I'm not no, using no, a bread this knife. This is not a bread knife. No. Yeah. But hey, if I'm hungover, I don't care. How yeah, much bread do you want for this little egg? Right? <laughs> there. I want three bits. I'm a growing three. boy. Yeah. Stefano wanted to cook my hangover away, and I wasn't about to stop him. <laughs> no, but look, it's, it's right. It's, it's, it's guts, gutsy food. I can see that sausage has got a little bit of a red hot chili in it. It's also got some fennel. So to the spicy sausage, he adds local freshwater yabbies that have been marinated in garlic oil. We enjoy a little hair of the dog before it's back to the pan and stove, where he continues to cook the ingredients over a gentle heat. He then adds six free-range eggs, a generous pinch of Murray River salt, followed by a little cracked pepper. Within six minutes, breakfast is served. Look, you can throw in some uh, parsley or some coriander or some whatever herb. Some chives would be nice as well. But this is the basic idea, okay? Have a go and have a taste. Look at that. Huh? Mm. Oh. It's a bit Asian-ish, isn't it? We well, don't sort of expect the, the yabbies to be in there because the traditional breakfast is like eggs and bacon or sausage. Yeah. But then you've got this beautiful texture and that salt. It's just really grabbing me. It just all really binds it together. It's yeah, beautiful. but it is not aggressive. No. It's not aggressive salt. Now, you can't have a cafe latte with that though. You do the beer. <laughs> but this, you know is, this, I mean? is, this is the <laughs> European way, beer with well, breakfast. It's not bad for somebody who's being up all night. Hey, straight for the jugular, you don't even ask me what it is. I'll tell you what it is when I get to the bottom of the glass. Mm. It's mm. a pilsner, right? Mm. <laughs> My father used to have a glass of red, but he'd been up milking cows since five o'clock. Mm. So what a day with Stefano, my god, mad foodie. But this is an isolated community, Mildura. You know, it has its own set of issues. And with the salt tablelands rising and that sort of thing, it really goes to show that passionate people like Stefano are really leading the way and holding the whole thing together. You know, he's a patron of the salt, and that went into pretty much everything we ate today. So after learning the breakfast, my god, I think it's time to work it out and go and create a hangover.